Okay. Hello, guys. My name is Mosh Myers. I'm a neuropsychopharmacologist. Uh, and what is that? We study the brain, behavior, and the drugs. Uh, but firstly, before I would like to start, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the land in which we meet of the Wajak Noongar people and acknowledge all uh, elders past, present, and emerging. Cool. So I'm just going to jump right into it. I'd like to firstly talk about the origins of cannabis. It evolved from an ancestor of hops 28 million years ago in China near Qinghai Lake. This is high elevation in the uh, Tibetan Plateau, about 3,000 meters above sea level. And it's very likely that THC evolved to protect the seeds from the uh, sun, UV damage, and genetic de degradation so it can continue passing on without mutating. There are many different types of cannabis. There are currently three main identified forms of cannabis. These be uh, cannabis sativa, cannabis indica, and cannabis ruderalis. There are seven different types of putative taxa. This include cannabis Afghanistan and cannabis um, chinensis. There's also this interesting thing about Australian bastard cannabis, which is this interesting morphological cannabis in this top here, which may have uh, been brought to uh, Australia in the 1800s and is in a garden escapee that's been living uh, in the bush ever since. Phenotypically, there's no big differences, but, sorry, there is big phenotypical differences between them, some being a tall plant with the thin leaves and some being short plants with thick leaves, and this is the difference between Steve and Indica. As far as their actual like, components go, there is no large differences. Um, the only difference there being the industrial low THC hemp and the high THC kush or medicinal cannabis. Cannabis was first used 12,000 years ago uh, as a fiber in China, and the first documented use of it as a food crop was 10,000 years ago in Japan. The first documented use of it as a medicine was in 28, sorry, 2800 BCE, so about like 6,000 years ago, in China where it was found in a um, tomb. Uh, cannabis was spread by Proto-Indo-Europeans from about this area outwards. Uh, and it was really spread by the Krugans and the Scythians, who first documented in theogenic use where they would use golden bongs, where they found some charred cannabis uh, in the bottom of them. And the Scythians would create, I guess, the first form of a hot box where they would make a teepee and burn cannabis, and they would go inside and sauna in the steam, and this was in commemoration of the dead. Further on, Assyrians and Mesopotamians found the medicinal properties of them, and they would use it as a medical salve. Same with the Egyptians, where they would use it for inflammations. Interestingly enough, it's also mentioned in the Torah, which is the Jewish scripture. Uh, in Christianity, it would be called the Old Testament. And it was used as a holy oil and a way to speak to God. Interestingly enough, here it is written in the Torah, Keneh Bosim, was, was the translation, and it translates to sweet aromatic reed. In more recent history, in the 1500s, cannabis was uh, smoked medicinally in most cultures, not so much by the Europeans, but there is a lot of discussion that in the 1700s, once tobacco became a little bit more smoked, Shakespeare actually started using it, and the, uh, traces of it were found in his white pipes, the white clay pipes in his house. In 1621, the anatomy of melancholy also stated cannabis as a treatment for depression, and it was commonly grown in the 1600s in America by law because hemp was used as a rope there. Uh, Pre-prohibition, uh, cannabis was used extensively. Uh, you can see here some cough syrup that contains alcohol, cannabis in indica, chloroform, and morphine. That definitely would put you to sleep. Uh, and there was over 2,000 pre-1937, so before prohibition, patents for uh, cannabis. And as Dan discussed, the prohibition really like, degraded a lot of the, the movement forward um, in the findings of cannabinoids. But in the early 1800s, uh, uh, a lot of chemists in Britain were having a lot of fun uh, distilling and figuring out what extracts there were in cannabis. And there's actually some interesting reports of these people uh, taking cannabis extracts, walking around their lab and just staring into glassware aimlessly, not knowing what they were doing. <laughs> Interestingly enough, the first cannabinoid that they uh, actually isolated was cannabinol. Uh, and this was thought to be the active ingredient. However, it turned out not to be. Um, and they also would try to synthesize, or synthesize, um, synthesize it, this guy called, um, what was his name, Adams. And he only managed to get cannabidiol, but he switched his process up and managed to get cannabinol. When he gave these two components to dogs at the time, which is what they were studying on, they were looking at the amount of ataxia that occurred, so immobility in dogs, there was not as much that occurred from these two compounds as compared to the uh, oil itself. So he presumed that cannabinol was likely not the active component, nor was CBD. Um, he then did some chemistry on CBD and managed to create uh, THC, and then he did some more chemistry on the plant and isolated a bunch of tetrahydrocannabinols, um, and that was likely the active ingredient. So this is um, the current extraction process, which is actually very similar to what they did back in the day. 
Um, and then not much went on for a very long time because of the prohibition that was going on on cannabis. And in 1964, an Israeli guy called Meshulam was like, well, what is the active component of cannabis? We know what the active component is of opium. We know what the active component is of cocaine. What is, what is, what is cannabis? So he, he got some hashish uh, from the police down at the, the, the station, got in a bit of trouble for that in the end, figured it out. But he managed to isolate THC directly from the cannabis plant in 1964 once technology was actually good enough. And it wasn't until 1965 that they managed to synthetically isolate the isomer and find that it was negative trans delta 9 THC, the active component of cannabis that gets you high. Uh, it was interesting because you look at cocaine, which was discovered in 1901, they won a Nobel Prize. Heroin and morphine was discovered in 1925, they won a Nobel Prize. LSD was discovered in 1938, diazepam in 1959. All of these drugs look quite more complex than our little THC over here, but still it wasn't discovered until 19, 1965. Again, likely due to the prohibition and not much research going on. Uh, once cannabis THC was found, they started going, oh, let's design some more synthetic cannabinoids. So the American military was looking at incapacitating agents so that they could aerosolize, and in the 1950s, they started developing cannabinoids. Dimethyl Hepyltryptin, I believe is what this one was called. Triptyl, triptyl, the name's past me. I'm better with the numbers, CP55940 hit me there. Um, uh, and uh, this information wasn't released until the 1970s. In the 1980s, they developed CP55940, which was one of the, the first non-opioid analgesics which they used, and it was actually very, very potent. This was the first full agonist that was ever found. Uh, in more recent history, uh, Nabilone over here was developed in 1985, but wasn't approved for patents until 2006. And after that, it was used in medicine in many countries. UK, Canada, Australia, mainly for chemotherapy-induced nausea. Um, around the same time period, a lot of the drug prohibition was going on, and people realized that there were synthetic cannabinoids out there. And they started developing a whole sleuth of different uh, synthetic cannabinoids that they would put onto uh, inactive compounds such as Damiana, and they would sell these at um, like head shops over the counter that you could buy. Uh, these drugs are very, very potent. Um, AM2389 is the most potent cannabinoid ever created. It's 63 times more potent than cannabis at binding to the receptor. So a smaller amount of this is required as compared to THC. The other thing that's interesting about these drugs is that these are full agonists. So when THC binds to these receptors, it will only ever uh, activate the receptors to half its maximal potential, whereas these will fully um, activate the receptor to its full potential. Another way of describing this here, um, when THC binds, it will only ever inhibit its secondary messengers halfway, so these are continue activating, activating to their full amount. These are reduced, whereas when these synthetic cannabinoids bind, they completely inhibit uh, the ability of the receptor to function. So here's just a sleuth of them that they spray on, and I'd like to bring your attention to this top diagram up here. So here we have JWHA. This is one of the very first compounds that were ever released, and it got quickly banned. So what did the chemists do? They changed the structure very slightly, what we can see here in red. We have AB001. This then was also quickly banned, so they changed the structure again slightly, adding a nitrogen group here, and we have SDB001. This then was quickly banned, so they chucked a nitrogen group over here, and now we have AKB48. This then quickly got banned, so they chucked a fluorine group down here, and now we have 5F AKB48. And this continues to go on and on and on and on, and there's a constant chase uh, with chemists and the law about these compounds here. In Australia, though, we've introduced an act where it's banned by mechanism of action, so anything that binds to CB1 receptors is made illegal. So now that we have these drugs, there must be some receptor that these drugs bind to. In the 1970s and 80s, it was presumed that THC did not have a receptor because it was fairly um, poorly uh, separated from its more inactive enantiomer, and they believed it just did some things to the, to the cell membranes. Turns out there was this person called Melvin who uh, radio-labeled CP55940, which means made it radioactive, so it puts out some uh, decay. And they chucked them into a PET scan and looked at the radioactive decay when it bound to these receptors. And this is what we can see in this image here. I'll get to a bigger one further down the track. And this was the first inkling like, that we knew that there was cannabinoid receptor in the brain. And in that same year, they actually managed to code a genetic sequence for this receptor. Uh, now that we have a receptor, there must be some sort of endogenous pound to bind to this because you know, there's, there's no reason that God or some higher entity would have given us this receptor for a plant to bind to. Uh, and it was found in 19, sorry, it was found in, what year was it? Sorry, uh, 1980, I believe. Um, and it's found in all chordate animals, uh, 
peripheral cannabinoid receptors weren't found until 1993. This is some person studying macrophages in the immune system and found that there was a separate receptor, and this was the discovery of CB2. So we now have CB1 and CB2 receptors. And now in 2021, there is putative evidence for CB3, 4, and 5 receptors, which may be these orphaned receptors, but more research needs to be done. So CB1 receptors are mainly found in the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord, and the, the nerves. And the CB2 receptors are mainly found peripherally in immune cells. So in the brain, CB1 receptors are quite widespread. And some say that it's the most dense G protein found throughout the brain. Um, it's mainly found in movement areas, such as the basal ganglia here, and in areas that control somatosensation, mood regulation, and motor function. So areas in red show higher densities of, of cannabinoid one receptors compared to the lower areas. So <clears throat> now that we have these receptors, there has to be some endogenous compound. Um, and they found endocannabinoids in um, sorry, 1992 by uh, uh, homogenizing a bunch of pig brains, and they put uh, who uh, 243 through, and we're looking at what chemicals were displaced. This is kind of like a diagram here. So you have the binding of WHO 2023, 20, and then anandamide displacing it. And in the washouts of this, they managed to find this, this compound. And anandamide was named uh, it's because it's Sanskrit for uh, bliss. Uh, its true chemical name is arachidonyl ethanolamide, and there's quite a, quite a few of them. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, it's got a very uh, integrated system with um, cyclooxygenase and lipooxygenase. These are enzymes which a lot of um, NSAIDs, so ibuprofen, uh, naproxen, and things inhibit. So all of those actually end up having interesting um, endocannabinoid pharmacology. Um, the structure of these, they look quite different to the cannabinoids that we're used to. We have these long chain fatty acids uh, compared to these quite tight cyclic groups, and then these synthetic cannabinoids, which look completely different to them all. You might be looking at me going, how the hell does this resemble this in any sort of way? But when we look at 3D structures of them in the, in the body, uh, the van der Waal forces, they end up folding up into very similar compounds. So when they bind to the receptors, they look very similar. And then when we have here, we have here in red and in green, the sections that interact with the receptor once it's bound. So when they're in the receptor, they actually become quite similar to one another. Oops. So how do these endocannabinoids work? They reduce the chance of exotoxicity. They synthesize on demand postsynaptically, where they move retrograde to presynaptic flow to reduce signal transduction. Oh my god, what the hell does this all mean? Let's go through it. Look at this beautiful picture. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. All right, I'll step it, I'll step it down a little bit more. In the brain, we have neurons. And neurons communicate each other, with each other with a synapse. And this is our synapse. So neurotransmitters are released from this presynapse, which is this neuron here onto the postsynapse, which would be this neuron here. And they propagate the action potential flow through this way. And this is my synapse, my beautiful synapse. So here we have the receptors, we have vesicles, and we have some channels, a CB1 receptors, and a postsynaptic cell. So what happens when an action potential hits the neuron? Some channels open, action potential is propagated. Further, some more channels open up, letting some more ions in. And when these ions make it into the cell, they start moving the vesicles, which cause neurotransmitter release. These neurotransmitters then bind to postsynaptic receptors, which allow more thing, uh, uh, channels to open, allow ions in, which continue this action potential in the postsynaptic cell. Where does the endocannabinoid system come in? When this postsynaptic receptor cell starts getting activated, cannabinoid enzymes are activated and they start synthesizing endocannabinoids such as anandamide and 2-AG. These then, as I said, move retrograde to the neurotransmitter flow, so the neurotransmitters are releasing this way. These are moving backwards to them, and they bind to cannabinoid 1 receptors. When they're bound to these cannabinoid 1 receptors, they inhibit them, and through a bunch of second messenger cascades, prevent the release of more neurotransmitters when the next action potential arrives. Uh, after this, these uh, secondary enzymes activated will start breaking down 2-AG and anandamide, so these can't, keep binding, they can't continuously bind to the receptor. Uh, and yes, so once the next action potential arrives, it doesn't propagate. So where does THC step into this? This whole thing's about cannabinoids, not endocannabinoids. So THC just binds to the receptor. There's no need for anandamide to be released and comes up. Just straight binds to the receptor activates the second messenger systems and inhibits more vesicles being released. So the next time an action potential arrives, only a small amount of neurotransmitters is released compared to when it's not bound. Oh, but Marsh, where does dopamine come into this? 
Dopamine, everyone wants to know about dopamine. So the story gets a little bit more complicated when we bring dopamine into this. So let's, let's uh, look at it here pretty basically. We have a dopamine neuron, we have an excitatory neuron, and we have our inhibitory neuron. This is very basic, very simple. The excitatory neuron receives an action potential, it's propagated down and starts releasing glutamate onto this dopamine neuron. This excites the dopamine neuron, the dopamine neuron propagates an action potential down and then releases dopamine. Relatively straightforward. Now let's make it a little bit more complicated. All right, so a glutamate neuron it receives its, its action potential and a GABA neuron, which is an inhibitory neuron, receives a larger action potential. These then release the neurotransmitters on this dopamine neuron, but there's a bit of conflict that's going on because this is saying, hey, fire, activate, release dopamine, and this is saying, no, don't, don't release dopamine, but this is wide a bit larger. So the net outcome of this is no release of dopamine. All right? So now we introduce THC to the mix. Let's make it really complicated. THC binds to this inhibitory neuron now. So when the action potential is propagated, no or not a lot of neurotransmitters are released. Therefore, there's not much inhibitory action here. So this, prop, this, this is excited, and dopamine neuron receives an action potential, and dopamine is released. So this is the colloquial uh, common uh, term about how cannabis increases dopamine release in the brain. It's inhibiting these GABA neurons causing glutamate to be excited and, and excite dopamine neurons, releasing more dopamine. But there's a catch. Glutamate neurons and GABA neurons both have cannabinoid 1 receptors, so what would be the net outcome of this? And even more, this is really simplified. This is only three neurons. In the brain, there's hundreds of thousands of neurons. They're all communicating with each other. They're all inhibiting each other. They're all trying to excite each other. They're all getting impulses from this to stop. So it gets really, really complicated. So what are the effects of uh, cannabis then? So on a small level, it's pretty easy. We can say that it just inhibits the neurotransmitters, but on a macro level, it's bloody difficult, especially when we start looking at all of these neural networks. So what's easiest thing is we've got to look at the brain and organism as a whole and the reported subjective effects. Some of the reported subjective effects, sedation, appetite enhancement, or the munchies, bodily sensations feel nice. You get a dry mouth, there's muscle relaxation. There's slight color enhancement, there's brightness alterations. Uh, it, depending on the individual, it's strongly suppressed or enhanced anxiety. It's creativity enhancement, music appreciation, novelty suppression, and euphoria. I'll skip that slide. If anyone wants to ask me about this in question time, please do. Uh, <laughs> so the way that cannabis is used can alter the effects as well, so the route of administration, the form, and the set and setting. So whether cannabis is oral or smoked completely changed. So smoked cannabis is very quick onset and offset, whereas oral cannabis has a much lower onset and offset. These two diagrams just show the plasma levels that are taken. So each inhalation that this person takes, you can see the plasma levels increase and then they kind of plateau off. If he had stopped inhaling here, it would have plateaued off and started to come down as well. Uh, cannabis oils, resins, and leaves have a much higher percentage of THC. Therefore, the higher dose of THC is given and um, cannabis is uh, dose response dependent. So when you consume more of it, you get higher. However, there is technically a pharmacological limit because it only activates the receptor halfway, so you'll never get as high as a synthetic cannabinoid. Furthermore, a lot of uh, experienced users subconsciously titrate the desired um, dose. Tolerance is also a key player in this. So chronic daily smokers will have less cannabinoid run receptors than people that um, infrequently use. So you can see here there's lots of cannabinoid receptors. They start taking uh, lots of... Um, uh, cannabinoids that bind and then the cannabinoid receptors are reduced. This is because the body wants to stay at homeostasis and stay in a, in a, in a nice um, flat playing field. There's also set and setting. Cannabis may or may not be a psychedelic drug. It's probably not a psychedelic drug, but it has uh, components that are influenced similar, in similar ways. There's no overdoses that have been reported from cannabis, um, but some people tried to figure out what it would take to actually kill uh, a monkey or a human. Um, so they gave 128 milligrams per kilogram of THC IV to a monkey and they unfortunately died. This is equivalent to a 75 kilogram person smoking 48 grams of 20% cannabis at once, which is a <laughs> phenomenal amount. However, these same people also gave 9,000 milligrams per kilograms uh, perioper uh, uh, PO, so it's kind of equivalent to us eating it, but that would be equivalent to eating 3.37 kilograms orally at once, and they still didn't die. So what's cannabis used for in medicine? Lots of different things. Seems to be this like great panacea as lots of people said, so a drug that can cure lots of different conditions, nor appetite, chronic pain, specificity, PTSD, and so on and so forth. I see uh, Stephen walking up. I'm just quickly going to talk about my research, but let's save that for question time, shall we? Uh, my take home message from this really don't mess with synthetic cannabinoids. Cool.